All right, we're going to do another old school, way, way old school, new school hand analysis with a hand that happened a long time ago. It was a really cool format with freaking heart monitors and the whole spiel, and you'll get a sense of what it's like to be me versus Mike Mattisell when you hook up to a heart monitor and you both have the same hand, and you check what those heart rates look like, and you wonder how the heck this guy's still alive. Anyway, before we get to that, we got the Rocky T. If you want one, go to contendersclothing.com, use Kid Poker 20, save 20% off. If you like Cobra Kai, you like Karate Kid, you like uh, Muhammad Ali, all that kind of stuff. You got briefs, you got boxers, you got t-shirts, you got tanks, you name it. Go get yourself one. Look sexy like me. Uh, yeah, so I don't know. And listen, I'm not making a billion dollars off that, but I really like the stuff, so I like to promote it, okay? I make like half a billion, not even close. All right, so this hand is kind of crazy and goofy. This was a unique event for Fox. It's called the Showdown at the Sands, right? Is that where it was? Yeah, at the Sands in Atlantic City. Carl Icahn, I think, owned the building at the time. So, you know, this is uh, early days of televised poker, and they decided to come up with a cool concept where the players would wear heart monitors. And uh, I developed a nickname on this show called the Ice King for having a resting heart rate that... uh, Stayed pretty solid, and where Mike Matisos, hopefully you can get a shot of that on the screen when we're in the big pot, where you see Mike's and you see mine. <laughs> and I'll get to that in just a minute. But we're going to break down this hand. Both me and Mike are crushing it in chips in this tournament back in the early 2000s. I'm chip leader, I think, and he might be like third or something like that. So we're going to go old school. All right. Folds around to me on the button. And I got Mikey in the big blind. And Mikey's kind of a maniac with three betting. He like he's like one of those guys, you know. He likes to re-raise. He doesn't like small ball. He's just fucking nuts. Re-raise, bomb, bomb, crazy shit. When he's like in a mood, you know, if he's off his meds or something, I don't know. He goes cuckoo sometimes, right? So I'm like, all right, well, I want to see a flop because I got nine seven of spades, and I don't really want to open, have him do his bonkers shit, and then like have to make the pot bigger, especially because he's got a lot of chips, and I don't really want to play a big pot with him. You know what I mean? I'd rather just like. Uh, just, you know, avoid that and continue to chip away small ball style. So I limp. Now Mikey, of course, goes ahead and makes it 16,000, right? Which I, of course, decide to call. I've already, I think I put in four. I think I limped for 4,000, right? Something like that. So yeah, I mean, I basically, I think he makes it like 4x, four times the blind. So of course, I'm going to take a flop. We're deep. Now I got a good hand to see a flop with. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think, well, I'll tell you that in the second part. So I call, as I said, and the flop comes nine, four, deuce, two diamonds, one club. I don't have a back door. And Mikey goes ahead and he C bets to 20, he C bets 23,000, right? Which is pretty standard for back in the day, you know. It's actually a decent bet for him uh, to make size wise. And I get a little goofy here with my hand. Um, and I decide, you know, I think Mikey's got shit a lot here. I think he's just got like ace f- high. So I'm just going to take the pot right now, not mess with it, not let a card come off and have him go bomb, bomb, bomb. So I have a tough decision. So I'm going to go ahead and raise and I make it about 70,000. And Mike just goes all in for 215, right? So I'm like, holy shit, can I really fold here against Mike with top pair? Uh, and at the time, as I said, Mike was a little wild in these spots. He's not anymore. He's got old nitty. But in that, those times, like he could have a flush draw. He could just be bluffing with total randomness. And I felt like he was in a mood to bluff, you know? So I was like, ah, oh, shit. I put myself in a bad spot here, but I can't really fold for 140 more, I don't think. So I go ahead and make the call. And uh, somehow Mikey has the same fucking hand. <laughs> he, has the, he had the 9-7 off suit. So we play like a massive pot. And as you can see, if you look, my heart rate, we have the exact same hand. Right? My heart rate stayed right around 67 to 72. His shot up to like an ungodly level, like he was running like a 10 second, 100 meter dash. I think he was up to like 160, 170, you know, beats per minute in this spot. Um, probably a lot more coffee and who knows what else. This was during Mikey's uh, heyday. <laughs> you know what I mean? He might've had some of the, uh, the candy up his nose. I don't know what he was doing back then, bro. <laughs> he was having fun. So that was a hand that... Uh, we got it all in, and uh, again, we had the heart monitors on, on TV, a little bit goofy, and uh, that's the old school 
wrap up of, of how we're going to do it because there's not much more to talk about. But I'm going to say that, and a lot of you asked me in some of the comments to say, like, can you talk about a hand that you played badly and how it would be better? New school. Yeah, this is it, okay? Because this was not a well-played hand by me, nor him, frankly. But especially considering ICM and all these other factors that you want to consider when you're in a tournament and you have two players that are like really, really deep and doing well and everyone else is kind of weaker, there's not a lot of reason for you to go to battle and risk it on with really stupid marginal hands like this. So everything about the hand from pretty much both of our perspectives was pretty bad. And I'm going to go over what he did wrong and I'm going to go over what I did wrong. And we're going to do it with this breakdown. Okay. So folds around to me. Um, at this stage of poker and where it was at, I think it was fine to have like a limping range and it didn't have to be entirely balanced. Um, having said that, I think today, considering the de- stack depths and how deep we were, I would probably come with uh, at least a min raise, probably anywhere from 2.2 to 2.5x, frankly, as deep as we were. And, uh, you know, limping is fine, again, but I don't think that uh, back in that stage I had a balanced, constructed limping range, so it's probably safer to go ahead and raise with my hand, take the initiative on the, in, in that spot. And, again, 9.7 suited is a hand that I'm always going to play, never folding it. Um, and I don't think limping with it occasionally is bad. But again, if you start to go down that path of adding limping to your repertoire, uh, you know, doing that in a balanced way today matters. Back then, probably not as much. And I probably why I did it a little more because it's like, whatever, I can limp more. And uh, as I said, in the old school, my thought process was keeping pot size small because Mike Mattisau, I knew was willing to get it in a lot lighter than I wanted to. Um, but again, having played the hand over, if I could do it now, I would just go ahead and raise with the 9-7 suited. And if he three bets, depending on the size, I'm probably going to have a hand that calls. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend with 9-7 suited. So as played, I limp. Mike Madison makes it 4x with 9-7 offsuit. It's not pr- probably not a, a good thing here. It's probably not a thing to do with 9-7 offsuit. It's fine to have a raising range here for that size. Um, but considering I already limped in the button, there's, I don't really have... Uh, all that much of a limp folding range. When I limp for one, I'm not folding for three more. Like what range really does that? I'm, if I limp for one, I'm probably calling the raise. And now you're going to play an inflated pot out of position against the chip leader when you're deep with 9-7 offsuit. So not a good play from him to do that. I have a slam dunk call here with 9-7 of spades. 100% of the time I'm going to call here. I'm never going to... This isn't a good hand to, to three bet, to re-raise, like to limp raise bluff with. Um... You'd be better off doing it with a hand that doesn't play have such good playability post flop. So maybe king five suited, ace four suited type of hands like that would be better off uh, to use as your raise bluffs as well as your premium hands that you would limp raise with there. Uh, if you are using a balanced limping strategy, as I said, if we modernize this in this hand, this hand wouldn't play this way because I would have opened. Maybe he three bets, maybe he doesn't. We're not sure. Um, so yeah, now we've got thirty two thousand in this pot. Flops 9-4 deuce. I have 9-7. No backdoor flush draw. Now, this board, uh, using new school thought process, this flop favors Mike Mattisau's range significantly because you would assume that he doesn't... I don't have any overpairs here, really. I mean, I don't really limp with 10s jacks. I don't think that was... It was certainly not part of my balanced limping range back then, and I don't know that it would be today if I ever used one. Uh, when you're playing that deep, which I don't think will happen. Um, so, so it's a good range for him to bet. Um, it's a good flop for him to size up, which he does. He bets 23 into 32. So we're in the neighborhood of 60, 65%, which is good, you know, with his entire range. Um, and for me, against this bet size, there's really only one option. And it isn't the one that I chose, okay? Um, Raising my hand sort of turns it into a bluff. It's really like a C. It's one of those find out where you're at kind of stupid old school raises that don't make a lot of sense. My hand does really well as a flat. It's not, it's A, it's not really good enough. It's, my hand is not strong enough to want to play for stacks in this spot. And I need a calling range against big. When someone raises pre in this spot and then bets big after flop, you shouldn't have a very extensive raising range. You should be raising very seldomly. If they're betting quarter pot, you can raise more often. But against the size that he chose, really all I have is a flat, um, especially with the kind of hand that I have. And I, and I should also be flatting here with hands like 10 jack of clubs as a float, you know, ace-five suiteds, all my pocket pairs, 
my good aces should probably continue to the turn in position, but raising here is a mistake with my hand, flat, you know, plain and simple. The size choice I make also is probably a little biggish considering how much is behind, right? Um, Mikey has 215,000. Me making it 70 kind of puts me in an awkward spot if he does jam because now I'm getting like a really good price to call and his jam can include some hands where, like a decent amount of hands where I'm actually doing fine against, but I don't really want to necessarily play for stacks. Like if he has ace, jack of diamonds, ace, king of diamonds, and I raise his flop, he's just going to get it in with those hands. And in those spots, he's a small favorite, but I would have to call, right? So rather than put myself in this awkward position, I should probably just be flatting here, not raising. And if I am raising, well, I just shouldn't be. I mean, there's really not a lot of wiggle room to, to, to make a small raise here and then fold. You just don't want to be playing your hands that way, especially with top pair, especially when the board is draw heavy, kind of, because there's two, flu- two diamonds there. And again, Mike could have some ace five suited and ace threes and stuff like that as well. So raising here is just a cardinal sin. You should be flatting. If you are going to be, you should be calling or folding here your entire range. Like even with sets, frankly, like if I have a set here, I should probably just flat because you need to strengthen that calling range, right? So if you're strengthening your calling range by putting all your sets and, you know, your strong hands in there, then you can't be raising with your marginal, you know, nines and you shouldn't be raised bluffing really. You should just be waiting till the turn. Uh, As played, I raised. Mike now against the raise, he does have the seven of diamonds, which is not a good card for him to have. Why is that? Sure, it gives him a three flush, but it eliminates part of the range that I could be bluffing with. If I have, let's say, seven, eight of diamonds or five, seven of diamonds or something like that. So not a great card for him to have in his hand. Having said that, he's in a tough spot here uh, with his hand specifically in terms of, he can't fold his hand. His hand's too good. Um, although it's not, <laughs> you know, what I mean? it's, it's really a fucking stupid hand played by both of us. Um, so as played, like, I think it's okay for him to use a mixed strategy of flatting and jamming with his hand with the nine, seven. Now ask yourself this question. Like, what do you If you're jamming with the nine, what would be the purpose of jamming? I guess it's multifaceted. One is to protect the nine equity, right? Against draws Two, maybe bluff a better nine. Like if I decided to, I mean, I raised with nine, seven, which is a bad play. Maybe I had nine, eight and maybe I'll fold it or something along those lines. And you have a hand that's probably too strong to fold. So this was a case here. This hand was a case of two guys just completely overplaying their hands and donking it up with hands, with parts of their range that just don't belong in this equation whatsoever. With plays that uh, just don't compute. Mike's raise with the hand preflop, not good. My limp's okay. Again, as I said, in a modern strategy, you can have a limping range here. But again, it's not something that I would do today. And then my raise on the, his bet size in the flop, we like it. It's good with the hand that he has. All things fine there. My raise is atrocious. Just terrible. Really not a good raise with this hand. Uh, shouldn't have a raising range at all, as we said. And then his jam. Um, at the time, I actually think his jam is bad because I'm not... His jam is bad at the, at the time because back then, the way that I constructed ranges, I was not bluffing here. I probably wasn't raising with draws. So I was raising with like a nine or better. So if I have a nine or better, what nine or better do I have? I don't have nine, five, nine, six, really. So it's like the same nine, seven, nine, eight, or a better nine. And I'm probably not folding it anyway. So he probably, oh my God, it's a brutal hand. I can't believe we've even going over it. Like he could theoretically with his specific hand against me back then fold the flop to the raise because it's essentially forcing him to commit his entire stack and we're both burning ICM like idiots. So yeah, I think I'm done going over this one because we both played it so freaking bad, but I hope that you understand why, right? The raise on the flop, just, we both overplayed the shit out of it. The hand's supposed to go check, check, flop, maybe somebody bets, you know, small pot, jibbity jabbity on the way to the river and then we chop it. As it turned out, we played a monstrous pot where his heart rate had him almost freaking have cardiac arrest right there on the table, while over here, the Ice King stayed tranquilo throughout. So hope you enjoyed that goofy one, and I hope that answered the question of whether or not we're going to cover hands that I butchered, because that's certainly one. But so did he, right? I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, well, what are you doing? You're an idiot. Well, like, so are you. We were both complete idiots on this hand. No question about it.